This is a trap that I've designed, which is actually an open trap called a baited crab station, taken after a baited fish station. I'm dropping it underneath the Granville Bridge, which is located in Falls Creek. That's near Vancouver, BC. You'll notice the uh, four sections on it that each have wire-tied salmon carcass fillets. Pick them up at the local Granville Market. They seem to be an ideal food. You'll notice in the center, I also have four colored pieces of tape. We're going to drop this down to a depth of 25 feet, and the color tape will give me an idea of color attenuation through the water. In other words, as we go deeper in the water, our reds are muted, to say the least. And you can see the difference from the surface now. The red color is almost a salmon color. Now, this is attached to a two-foot square piece of quarter-inch plexiglass. And the reason why I did that is because as the crabs move around in this silty bottom, it creates a phenomenal amount of turbidity. Oh, you see a dog shark come in there. They're quite inquisitive, and you'll see him come in a little bit more, chopping some bait, <laughs> as he is doing there. There'll be another one coming in after that, and of course that one section of bait. So now I have a three out of four baited crab station. It'll take a few minutes for the turbidity to settle, and again, this is all live footage. So within one minute, we actually have our first set of crabs. These are Dungeness crabs. Cancer Magister, by scientific Latin name, that have come in to uh, get a free dinner on my salmon. There are two underwater color corrected lights on, and this is both good and bad. It's good in the sense that you'll see later it illuminates the crab quite well, but in the early stages of filming, the impact of my trap or my baited crab station to the bottom induce some turbidity because the sediment is so very, very fine. Now with lights, the lights then illuminate the turbidity, which is nothing more than debris in the water, giving us almost a snowfall type reflection, thus degrading the picture. You can see right there <coughs> how some of the sediment is moving by. Now that will settle down in a little while the crabs at first are a little skittish walking over plexiglass, so you can see them scrambling a little bit. Kind of weird, it's uh, sort of like uh, us trying to walk on ice, I guess. They can get no grip. Our dogfish comes in again. He's already had one morsel, and as the tape goes on, he certainly will have another. This is the early stage. It's only three minutes, and you can see we have about three crabs coming in there. <clears throat> now, you can get relative size. I get our dogfish, inquisitive as he may be. You get relative size by those tape sections that I have. So I know the exact dimension of the tape. So as the crab is next to us, I can actually measure the carapace length of the crab. The legal size for the dungeness. You can only take the nails, and the carapace, point to point, has got to be a minimum of 6.5 inches. The salmon carcass bait is secured to the plexiglass by some white nylon plastic, what they call wire ties or zip ties. And it's interesting to note, in picking up the platform when this is over, that several of them have actually been chewed through. So when I say chew, I mean use the claw to actually rip apart or to sever the tie to get the salmon carcass out, hence their meal. That dog shark is a little persistent devil. He's trying to eye up where he's gonna make his next attack. <laughs> he's nudging one of the crabs away from one of the baited stations. I don't know if it's a success or not. I think it is. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any bait on that station either. 
Crabs are a little bit more delicate feeders than the uh, dog sharks for sure. Now I'm using here a 180 degree 4K resolution camera. The camera is actually mounted above the base by only about five and a half to six inches. So you can see it's relatively close. And the reason for that is the secret to underwater photography is quite easy. You want to eliminate the water because all water is dirty. So the more dirt you have in it, the more turbidity, the more degraded your video or your photograph is. So the idea is wide angle lens get close. And the second thing is add color correcting filters. Now I have a salmon color a light red or salmon colored acetate filter on my underwater lights. So rather than just plain white, it actually gives a little bit of red adding to the red that has been filtered out by the 25 foot depth of the water column that I'm filming in. Now we're six minutes into the, the, the crabbing and you can see right now I count about six or maybe even possibly seven crabs. There's a baby that's getting pushed out in the center. It's very difficult to tell if these crabs are legal or to tell if they're male or female. The only way you could accurately do that is to actually use some kind of a net, a hoop net, and then retrieve them to the surface, measure them, and then of course return them after that. As in life, the larger dominant crabs tend to uh, kind of hog the bait a little bit. You can see them using their uh, little legs or their appendages to actually push the smaller crabs away. That one little crab is patiently waiting, trying to get his moment of opportunity. It's gonna make his pass, oops, maybe not. As a, as a marine scientist for years, I've used this concept of baited fish stations or baited crab stations, whatever you want to call it in this case, uh, to actually observe not just the behavior, but the population density of certain marine creatures. Uh, it helps in a number of different ways. One, we get an idea of how they are attracted to the bait. And in this case, you see the first crabs come in probably about a minute after the bait was in the water. The second thing that we can do is we can look at population densities and sizes, and that's easy if we stop the video, use a caliber or scale that we've previously set on our baited fish station. And I, I think the uh, third thing that would be very interesting, at least in this case, is to look at the preference of certain baits. Now in this case, we have four identical baits, which are nothing more than salmon parts. But in my next test, I'm actually going to try a couple of different ones. There's a rumor that uh, possibly chicken uh, backs or necks are very good. There's another rumor that if you take the cheapest cat food that you can buy, that oily, smelly stuff, poke a dozen or so holes into the can and then latch it on in a trap, that will be good bait because of the oily smell connected with it. And the fourth bait I would try to use would be, well, I haven't figured that one out yet. So maybe a pork chop, maybe a piece of steak, who knows? But I'm sure that the salmon will actually attract most of the crab because that is their food preference.
we're 10 minutes now into the video and uh it looks like one of the crabs just actually stole a big chunk of it and uh decided to get out of there and eat it on his own So in this case, we looks like we have between seven and nine crabs coming in and out of the frame, and we're we're approximately 12 minutes into the video, and we have about another five minutes remaining. So it's going to be interesting to see if we actually attract more crabs as time goes on. It would probably happen, except we have very very little bait left. As you'll see when I recover the trap, there's virtually nothing left in any of the four areas that I've secured it with the white wire ties. The turbidity that you see being kicked up in there is from the uh, crabs, and it looks like now we have some small flounder. I believe they're starry flounder. I'm not quite exactly sure, but they'll come in, and they actually uh, flap on the bottom, disturbing the sediment. And, of course, we have an incoming tide right now, and so the water is moving, and with the stirred-up sediment on the bottom from the flounder, it goes across the station, the baited station, and illuminated by the lights, reducing the visibility as you can see. This would be a crabber's dream to have this many legal male crabs in a trap when you bring it up. Thank you. 
Well, the trap has been down now approximately 17 minutes, and so I'm de I've decided to pull it up very slowly. Usually the crabs will scamper on this, uh, one of which is they don't want to come to the surface, a second of which then they wanted to uh, probably uh, hold onto the bait as long as they can. However, this is a little bit difficult because remember, they have no traction on this. This is like, uh, again, us walking on ice. Here goes one of them. Now take a bet on which is the last one to leave. <laughs> Who is most tenacious on this? And we have a winner. But you notice uh, the, one of the crabs will actually swim up now and try to get on it as it's coming up. There he is, he's swimming across, he can't make it. And notice how they drift backwards. So they're upside down drifting backwards as I bring the trap to the surface and end this little bit of science.